I am Judy Knight. I am the moderator tonight. And we will have a few words of welcome from the public library, namely Nathan, who is working his way up here. Nathan is standing in for his boss, Susan Simpson, who is out of town today. Okay, thank you all for coming tonight. Well, my name is Nathan Bender, and I am the Technical Services Librarian here at Albany County Public Library. This is the second of a series of candidate forums that the library and the League of Women Voters of Laramie are co-sponsoring before the general election. The room is set up courtesy of the library YAK group. We ask the audience to put chairs away at the end of the, as the forum ends. We continue to record these forums and we'll make them available on the library and the League of Women Voters websites. We have further information available on flyers at the back of the room. Our thanks to County IT for its help. Sample ballots are posted around the room on the back wall. There are two precinct maps over by the door. If you're a registered voter in Albany County, you receive the postcard to tell you your new precinct and ward information before the primary. If you moved since the mailing in May or the last general election and didn't vote in the primary, you'll need to correct your voter information at the county clerk's election office. The general election is Tuesday, November 6th. You can register and vote absentee until the day before election day. However, if you register or change your registration in any way 14 days before the election, you must vote on that day. On election day, you can register, change your registration, and vote. If you've changed your address, go to the clerk's web and find your new polling place and go there to change your registration. Uh, we've distributed evaluation forms uh, that helps us to get these filled out and we can tabulate them. Uh, candidates, uh, make sure your mic is on. Looks like we may have to share one of the mics a little more than we thought. Uh, audience members, let us know if you can't hear it. I'm pleased to introduce Judy Knight of the League of Women Voter, and thank you, Judy. Thank you, Nathan. I'd like to point out that the evaluation forms are, I think, the biggest stack that's on the table directly at the back of the room. Martha is holding one in her hand. I don't know what that means. Does that mean you want to give them to people, Martha? Oh, they have been distributed. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, before we get started tonight, I would like to ask any candidates for other offices who are not part of the forum tonight to stand up and introduce themselves. And I think we have two Matts here. <laughs> okay. My name is Matt Green, and I'm running for re-election in House District 45. My name is Matt Green. Okay. <laughs> Another Matt. My name is Matthew Blaylock. I'm running for City Council Ward 1. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, our ground rules tonight are that each candidate is going to have 90 seconds to respond. Or wait a minute, Joe Carroll, does that make it difficult for you? No. No? Okay. <laughs> So Carol Rock here at the front of the room is going to be our timekeeper, so she will hold up her various signs to let you know that uh, time is running short and that you should stop. And we are a fairly small group with six candidates here at the very mo uh, at this instance, so um, I'm hoping that we can get finished in an hour or less and give you half an hour at least to talk one-on-one -on -one with these candidates because you took the trouble to come out. You have some burning questions, I'm sure, that you would like to ask. But that's the second part of the ground rules. There are little pieces of paper at every row they are mostly discarded library 
memory card catalog <laughs> statements back from when they used to use paper. And I would like you to write your question on this. Hold up your hand and I will come and get it, or Martha will, or somebody will, and bring them to me. Maybe Dennis will, if that's a possibility. So hold up your hand when you have a question written down. And um, we are going to go in, we'll try to go in somewhat of a irregular order. So it isn't always the Tim Sullivan starting or Larry Munn. But I would like to introduce the candidates for you now who are here. Um, first of all, we have two candidates who are running for the one seat that is available on the Albany County Commission. That is our Democratic candidate, Tim Sullivan, and the Republican challenger, Shelley Towler. Then we have two candidates who are running for the Albany County, no, no, Fire District number one. And this is an office that is nonpartisan. Um, obviously, county commissioner is a partisan office. The nonpartisan office candidates who are here are Kirk Taft and George French. And there are two other candidates. One of them I remember is Henry Richter, I believe. Is that right? And then uh, Jeffrey Mitros, something like that. And I, have, Kirk, I'm going to depend on you. Are there three vacancies or two? Two vacancies. Two vacancies. Okay, so this is a contested office. Then we have two candidates who are running for seats on the Laramie Rivers Conservation District. They are Ruth Shepherd, who is running uncontested for the one urban seat that is automatically required a slot, if you, if you like. Um, oh, and I should say, the fire district, the only people who will vote are those who live in the donut surrounding Laramie, which is part of the fire district. Rock River South. Rock River South, okay. But it doesn't include the city of Laramie, does it? No. Oh, it, yeah, okay. Um, whereas the Laramie Rivers Conservation District, I believe, is a county-wide vote. It is a, a federal requirement that these people be elected, but it is a nonpartisan office. Now, next to Ruth, we have Larry Munn, who is running for one of the two, I think it's two, yes. um, rural seats. So there are two slots that are reserved this year for an ur uh, rural person. There are two slots for an urban person, and I, there is one at large seat as well. Um, there is one other person running, and that is um, Kelly, Kelly Kennedy. Kennedy. And since there are two seats, uh, there's nobody else, I don't believe. So um, think about write-ins for <laughs> these wonderful offices. You may start your campaign tonight. I'm sure Larry and Ruth would be happy to tell you how things work in the Laramie Rivers Conservation District. Um, be sure, candidates, and use the microphone. We've uh, identified one that works, which is, I guess, over there. And I will pass this one to the two county commissioner candidates. Remember that the election is Tuesday, November 6th, and that you may begin, or, you, or absentee voting has begun already, so you can go to the courthouse any time when the courthouse is open and run for, uh, or excuse me, and uh, make your, your vote. Okay, so, any questions from the candidates about our format? You see water and little coffee cups, so, um, be sure and take advantage of them. I'm, uh, I'm going to begin with a question for the county fire district. So we'll begin with you, Kirk. And the question is, um, do you agree with the ruling re recently given by the court that affects the fire districts? And that's the question. I don't know what the the answer is or what the issue was. Do you? Uh, yes. 
Uh, and yes, I do agree with the uh, ruling of the court that the uh, fire district has the power to organize, manage, and control the uh, fire protection within the district. This uh, came out of an unfortunate incident we were having with one of the departments, and it, uh, the department decided that it wasn't sure that they wanted to have the fire district put down policy and rules for, uh, that would apply to these volunteer fire departments. And uh, yes, the fire district does need to put out policy and control over the volunteer fire departments. George? To elaborate a little bit more on the background that Kirk gave, just to, uh, for those of you that don't know, within the Albany County Fire District number one, there are five volunteer departments, Centennial, Big Laramie, Little Laramie, Tie Siding, and Beetaboo. And that ruling came out of an unfortunate incident where we uh, had to seek an injunction against the chief who refused to recognize the authority of the district board and i agree that um, i wholeheartedly agree with the court on it was an unfortunate incident that we had to take that step but i um, certainly agree with the court's ruling in that case um, i would suggest anyone that has any questions on that to to please contact me or contact the district court and obtain a copy of the decision letter in that case i um, it's sort of a strange deal but something that we had to do nonetheless um, my one and only regret in that case is that at the time um, we did not i guess you'd say go far enough the scope was not broad enough we didn't think it needed to be and since that time regrettably um, we have had to terminate mr mitros as a member of the district um, and we are back in district court again so that's my one and only regret on Okay, thank you. Do any of the rest of you want to address that issue? County commissioner candidates, LRCD? Oh, okay. My policy will be to give you all a chance on any of these questions. Um, however, this one is specifically for the uh, Laramie Rivers Conservation District, so we'll start with Ruth. Um, and the question is, what exactly does the LRCD do? <laughs> That's what everyone wants to know, isn't it? Um, I, I have uh, a long history with conservation districts, and so they were basically set up and established with the old Soil Conservation Service that is now morphed into the Natural Resource Conservation Service on the federal level. They developed after the great uh, drought and it was because of the soil erosion that took place. So conservation districts are basically set up in every county in Wyoming um, to be able to address uh, projects that landowners as well as urban dwellers might bring to the district as potential projects for soil and water conservation. Uh, that also, can encompass then when you start talking about soil and water conservation. You're talking about wildlife habitat, livestock shared forage. You're talking uh, about uh, the grazing habits of both those animals and access to uh, both private and public lands. And we're confined to the boundaries of Albany County. So we will only address those issues of landowners and urban dwellers within Albany. Larry, would you address the financial issues? Where do you get your money? And well, I, uh, I'm incumbent, uh, have been on the advisory board for five years. I am not, however, the treasurer, so don't hold me to the nearest dollar, okay? But basically, we are on the tax roll for the county, and this, uh, I guess, kind of conditions our response to that is that we need to be cautious with the money uh, since it is coming from the taxpayers. We need to make sure that we get good value uh, for, for the money uh, that is used for largely cooperative projects. One of the things I like about the Conservation District is it is not compulsory. The people that we work with are all there because they want uh, they want to do something useful and 
They're simply looking for some technical or some financial assistance. And I point to the uh, Laramie River uh, stabilization, bank stabilization project and fish habitat uh, and so on improvement that was recently uh, completed. Uh, I'm a cheerleader on that. That was underway when I got onto the board. But uh, now the big project we have inside of Laramie is the cleaning up of the old refinery in Cedar Street. We also do uh, help with windbreaks for people on small acreages and other uh, small acreage um, land management issues. We help ranchers with solar panels to get better redistribution of livestock over rangeland. I think we work with just about everybody in the community who comes with something that's you know in our in our field of water, air, soil conservation, plant community uh, conservation, or whatever endangered species. We're working to try to prevent the sage grouse from becoming listed as an endangered species. Thank you. Okay, our next question, as you might have guessed, is for the county commissioner candidates. And the question is, how important is protecting the sovereignty of Albany County residents from not being annexed to Laramie? Here you are. Thank you, Judy. And I want to thank the League of Women Voters, the library, and everybody for coming out tonight because this is, uh, I know there's another debate going on that might be a little more interesting than this one, but, but uh, the sovereignty of the county residents. Uh, when I was a commissioner back in the 90s, we had that issue in Laramie County. The city of Cheyenne tried to annex the whole county, basically. And there was an uproar amongst the County Commissioners Association. I served on that committee, and we went to let we wrote the legislation, or we helped draft the legislation that prohibited any municipality from uh, annexing property within the county unless it was on three sides of the property, and they had to otherwise they would have to voluntarily be annexed. And so, to be annexed by a municipality you have to be surrounded and that's about it on three sites so it's a non-issue doesn't mean they won't try <laughs> I, I think they will i think they will make an attempt at it and i think it's pretty important to defend that i think that currently uh, residents in the county don't um, you know, they don't get some of the services because of the budget constraints, and I think that's something that needs to be, uh, there needs to be solutions found for that. And, uh, but I also think that would be uh, exacerbated if the city um, annexed any part of the, the county. Um, and regardless of whether it, it is a non-issue, as we know, the often attempts are made and we have to defend from that. If, if they do that, they may make a legal argument that, that there's an important public necessity for doing so. And if that should take place, I would defend that. Um, I think that the resources that would be available to people in the county under that sort of circumstance where they were annexed into the city would be, um, they would be not receiving even what they are now. Um, and I think in this economy, it's foolish to, to do that kind of move because the, the citizens will be funding that. It's not, it wouldn't be cheap, it would be expensive, it would cost the people in the city as, as well as the people in the county. And, and I think it will just drive taxes and services up. And as we know, the city services have already become rather prohibitively expensive. So I would like to try to avoid that by some sort of negotiation rather than getting into tangles or lawsuits, but they couldn't, they couldn't attempt to make an argument that there was an important public need for that. Okay, our next question is for all candidates, for all offices, and that is, considering inflation today, and I'm combining two questions, what are you going to do to keep the cost of county government, the cost of the fire district, the cost of the LRCD from uh, increasing greater than the late rate of inflation, and specifically with regard to lawsuits? So we'll start with Shelley. Sorry, did you hear the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it has to do with how are you going to keep, considering the rate of inflation today, how are you going to keep the cost of, say, county government at a level 
that does not exceed the rate of inflation, and particularly with regard to lawsuits. Lawsuits are a kind of separate issue to inflation, but certainly they would add to the the cost of operating a county if you were involved in a lot of, uh, a lot of lawsuits. And there are times when you cannot avoid lawsuits, but it would be best if you could negotiate and come to settlements prior to being engaged in, in that sort of lawsuit. Because in lawsuits, nobody wins. I mean, it costs everyone. Um, the budget, there, there needs to be some budget solutions for this county. And I don't want to make any promises because I think that would be a, a, a venture in, in, a, in, in a process. But um, this county does not have some of the resources that our other counties have, yet it has some very valuable resource uh, industries and, and, and industries in the sense that the, the, they are industry, but they are state-owned businesses, which are educational businesses, and they bring employment. However, they do not want to bring sales tax dollars or property tax dollars. And um, I think this, this county has a unique situation, and that needs to be addressed before we even get into the issue of inflation. Um, inflation could be heavily driven by what the federal government does. And I think we're all extremely worried about the, the current deficit approaching $16 trillion. And all the national economists say that $20 trillion is the tipping point. And we, don't, we all don't know what will happen if the tipping point is hit. But there certainly will be an economic cataclysm um, and will be affected by it as well. Um, how we deal with that, it, I think that will be a unique venture for every single city and county in the United States. Okay, uh, this is something that's going to affect everybody, and unfortunately, the federal government, the Federal Reserve Bank, has gone from a balance sheet of $800 million to over $3 trillion, and they're printing $60 billion a month as we speak and so hold on because we're going to have inflation and so at the county level we'll keep up with it as best we can but we're all in this boat together the city the county the hospital the school districts everybody and they're printing money to offset the deficit that, that we have and we're all going to be in a lot of trouble i'm afraid to say unless they stop spending in washington but i don't see that happening in the near future so as a county official, we have these funds coming from the state, thanks to the legislature, the governor, and we have federal funds coming in too. And so the board currently has taken the approach that we'll take all those funds that we can and put it into infrastructure at the county level, as far as equipment, buildings, improving the roads, and things of that nature, because there is no doubt in my mind, in the next three to five years, we're gonna have rapid inflation in this country and it's going to be affecting every municipality, every county, every city, and every family, unfortunately. You know, within the, the, the fire district, we're basically uh, authorized to get three bills of uh, tax money, and that's what uh, we uh, basically work on and uh, put together the budget to try and you know, maximize that to be able to you know, pay our you know, the insurance and we contract with Laramie to be able to get their support as well as to work with the volunteer fire departments to help reimburse some of their expenses. Uh, we also, you know, try to work for grants. A lot of the volunteer fire departments, also one of their big things is their fundraising activities through their open houses. That's also very important in the arena on how we can get the volunteer fire departments to uh, stay physically sound is the community support that they can get through their activities within their each area. As far as you know, ongoing lawsuits, we hope we can uh, limit them, but unfortunately it's a fact of life right at the moment, and that is uh, sucking some funds away, but hopefully we can get that uh, taken care of and uh, put the money back to going into the uh, fire protection uh, arena. George? 
Well, as Kirk already stated, we are limited to three mills, so you don't have to worry, we're not raising your taxes. <laughs> we don't even have that option. But uh, since in the time that I have been on the board, uh, one of the things that we have been sort of one of the directions we're going in is to try to promote efficiency. We have, uh, last year around this time, we sat down and did a five-year strategic plan. Um, we are now working with that and trying to use that to uh, help us plan for the future and to be more efficient. Um, and it's just something that's a constant battle. Unfortunately, when you put the word fire in front of any piece of equipment, whether it's a, a garden hose or a structure pumper, it triples the price, but that's, that's just something that we have to live with. Uh, but really the, the main thing we can do is just try to um, become as efficient as we possibly can. Um, as far as the, the lawsuits question, uh, thankfully that's not something that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, you know, as we discussed earlier, Unfortunately, in this one situation, we were sort of backed into the corner and we really had no other option, but um, that's not something that we really plan around. Okay, Ruth and Larry, do you want to address this? Well, one of the things we do is uh, try to keep the money that we spend inside the county as much as possible. For example, for the windbreaks that we cost share, uh, we insist that they use material, plant materials from the local nurseries, unless they absolutely, you know, it's absolutely not available within the county. We invest at the, with the local banks and uh, and so on. We do try to uh, do that. We also collaborate with other people, uh, city beautification groups, uh, the uh, community gardens at the schools. Uh, Tony Hoke, who's the district manager, is is really good uh, in terms of putting together a large project out of small pieces. I think he did that with the river restoration project very effectively, was a, a major player in that. And uh, he's a geohydrologist, so he's got a lot of expertise in a, in a discipline related to water quality, but his people skills are really good as well. And so we just try to work with others in the community. Uh, the litigation thing, uh, we're, uh, you know, I like to say working with willing collaborators uh, uh, and. Uh, Hopefully that uh, we you know can make sure that everybody feels they're getting uh, getting uh, part of their needs met when uh, when we work on these collaborative projects. But you never know how that goes. But uh, we we do try to you know for sure stay in black ink and we try to uh, make sure that uh, we're working with everyone in the community uh, together. Okay, conservation districts are also funded by a mill levy in Albany County doesn't receive a full mill, and it is controlled by the county commissioners. So it's not like we can expand a budget and go out and do uh, anything else with the tax money from the county itself. Um, to elaborate a little bit on what Larry talked about, on the greater county projects, the Wyoming Wildlife Heritage Trust Fund is also a partnership in collaborative uh, spending that we can work with. Uh, the NRCS, of course, we can work with them in collaborative spending, uh, depending on the depth and breadth of the projects that are brought to us. And so some of our um, ability to expand and do um, more complex projects are, might be dependent on the Farm Bill and the passage of the Farm Bill and whether or not that's funded on the federal level. And I agree with Larry. It would be pretty unique to find a conservation district in a lawsuit. We're at the uh, grassroots, the real grassroots level <laughs> of county government. <laughs> you can't get any more rooted down there than we are, so it would be pretty hard for us to be in that type of situation. Thank you. Our next question is specifically for county commissioners, but any of the rest of you who would like to address it are welcome. And that is, please give your opinion on the current status of land use planning in the county. And we'll start with you, Tim Sullivan. Land use planning. 
it's a, a, a statute that we have to have a land use plan or uh, and back in the early 70s it was a federal mandate that came down it wasn't a federal mandate but there was they had money attached to the funds that they were passing through states and so at that time back in the early 70s 74 or 5 the money passed through and if you took the money at the state level you had to have a land use plan and that's where the origination of the land use plan comes from in the state and the statutes we in albany county have adopted the land use plan and have a comprehensive plan back in the 90s we did not we initiated zoning and the z word is something that you'll hear around the state and it's fighting words in a lot of places and we, I have scars to prove it, Leah Talbot and Pat Gabriel and I went through that process and we had the zoning set up at that time and uh, land use plans and zoning protect the property and your, your investment in your property and so I'm all in favor of it. Joey? Um, purpose for land use planning was to, pro to provide for the general welfare and health and safety of the residents. Um, the purpose of it is to plan ahead for infrastructure, things like roads, sewers, so that you have these things happening in an orderly fashion, and also to plan for um, needs that the community has for fire and schools and health. Unfortunately, in this county, it's being used to regulate people, and I think we're being over-regulated by our land use plan. I don't think that they should be. I think that while you want um, zoning to take place because you don't want a pornography shop next to a school, um, it has to be narrowly tailored to the purpose, and it's not happening that way in the county. In fact, some people's property that have been used for a particular purpose for years is suddenly being changed. And it, I think the overall benefit to the community is not really happening. There has been a lot of controversy over whether or not some of the people that were involved in that comprehensive plan um, were people that represented, were a, a good cross-segment of the county. And I also feel that, um, or I spoke to some of those people who were actually on it, that said that the, the comprehensive plan and the zoning regulations that were being put in place and general land use planning was not really enumerating their original intent. And I think that's what's, we, we need to have this, but I, I think ours is going to strike. How about any of the rest of you candidates? Would you like to address this question? Larry? Just make a statement. There are there are some really significant on or not. Uh, there we go. Is that better? Yeah. I'd like to make the, the, the statement that there are some issues like water quality, for example, the city's aquifer. There, it's much cheaper to avoid a problem than it is to fix one after it has built up over years. And I think that just needs to be kept in mind in terms of some of the city county planning efforts is to look ahead and plan for the future because it is easier to uh, to uh, avoid problems sometimes and, and less expensive than, than have to go in and address them if they do occur. And I'm old enough to have seen uh, rivers catch fire in this country, uh, Cuyahoga River, Detroit River, one thing or another. I've seen uh, some major expenses involved in cleaning up uh, contamination in the past in that, and I think it would be good if we can preserve the really good quality of water we have, for example, in the, in the city's aquifer. And I'm not running for an office that will be responsible for doing that, so uh, I can, uh, can propose but not have to actually figure out how to do that. Anyone else? I'll, I'll speak to it as well, because um, when I lived in Carbon County, uh, it was during uh, the Bruce Babbitt's uh, Rangeland Reform 94, and he was the head of the Department of the Interior at that time. And I learned something really wonderful about counties having county land use plans. Without one, you cannot have any seat at the table when there is new federal planning for the forest or for the BLM land. And so without that, I would think the county's hands would be terribly tied. 
we really were able to not only have a seat at the table, but in the environmental impact statement that the federal government wrote for Rangeland Reform 94, Carbon County had two full pages in there because we did form and work with our county government to be able to respond to what we thought were maybe positive changes, things that the feds hadn't looked at. Again, bringing in that grassroots level of the people who have to live and work in these communities and make a living. So I found that a county land use plan can be highly beneficial. George? I think that land use planning at its most basic level, and I mean most basic, is probably a good idea, but I think in Albany County, land use planning has gotten completely out of hand. Uh, the problem with land use planning is that it is land control. And personally, that bothers me on a personal level. I believe that, um, especially in the West and in states like Wyoming, I think that private property rights are a big deal. Um, you know, I, basically I follow the motto, you don't tell me what to do with my property and I won't tell you what to do with yours. Um, I do agree that there are certain issues when it comes to, uh, to health and safety and uh, some basic environmental concerns, but anything past that I think is probably going too far. And the recent zoning amendment that was proposed, it's now um, tabled in the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, that was when they started breaking residential into numerous categories and in one category you could do one thing with your property and another one you couldn't do that and I think it was needlessly burdensome and overly complicated. Um, hopefully that doesn't come back again. Let's hope that it stays buried but Okay, I'm going to combine two questions again, and it will begin with the county commissioners, but again, anyone may answer. And that is, can you give specific examples of over-regulation in Albany County? And if you find an example, what would you do to limit this over-regulation. And we'll begin with Shelley, I guess. Well, what's passed was the APOZ zone and uh, zone portion of the regulation. And in that is, in section five, it says, no one may install, maintain, or use a wastewater septic system or hook up to a public sewer system. And that's a complete taking on all the properties in APOZ. It already is a taking because, uh, and, and this has been going on all throughout the lead up to this, people can't sell their property, the property values have dropped, and, I, and as people discover what restriction that is upon them, I believe there will be lawsuits, and I think that's a waste. And what I would do with it is, and, and furthermore, in the regs and in that aquifer um, portion that was passed, there really is nothing concrete to protect the aquifer from chemical spills, from uh, excessive use of fertilizer, from dumping, from other, from other things, and also the I-80 corridor. None of it was addressed in that, none of it's addressed in the regulations, and that's our biggest concern. And, and what I would do is I would go back, there shouldn't be a 100% taking on anybody's properties, that's a complete prohibition essentially to living out there. And that should needs to be reversed and some proper reasonable regulations need to be put in place and some monitoring. Thank you. Uh, regulations, we do have regulations that sometimes become erroneous and outdated and or technology changes. And so what we have done as county commissioners as those are brought forward to us we have gone back to the Planning and Zoning Commission and had those reversed or modified so they more accurately reflect what the current reality on the ground is. And I can give you one example, and that is with uh, small windmills in Centennial, I guess is a good example of that. 
all of a sudden we set up the regulations for windmills for residential uh, type of windmill and they were designed with the tall blades that would whistle around and all of a sudden they changed and there's different configurations and the technology changed and so what we did is we went back and had some problems with some distances and so we through citizen input and we went back to the zoning planning and zoning commission and had those changed as well as changed the regulations as they related to the new technology that came along and I can give you more examples as well but I think I'm out of time. Okay, anyone else want to address that issue? Just throw one in there, one of my pet peeves is the, uh, the zoning certificates that are required for building in the county. Uh, and this obviously is an extreme example, but uh, let's say a rancher who owns a uh, 10,000 acre ranch wants to build a five by five storage building in the middle of his property. In order to build that, he has to go to the county, fill out a multiple page application, provide a copy of his deed, a site plan, setback distances, the whole nine yards to build a little tiny storage building and pay them a fee. Now to me, that is absolutely absurd. I understand that in some cases, some of these building permits are necessary, but I think that it, one of those deals that needs to be updated and gone through and uh, put a little common sense into it. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to another question and imagine this. It's also for the county commissioners, but it may uh, affect some of, or some of the rest of you may have an opinion too. The question is, when the University of Wyoming buys up adjacent property, does the county lose tax revenue? And if so, would you consider working with some, uh, with the state legislature, I would imagine, to get some payments in lieu of taxes like the federal government pays? And Tim? That is an issue every time in this county we have you can't imagine how many church camps we have and how many churches we have, let alone the university. I think the assessed value of the university is probably $4 billion, I don't know, it's, a, it's quite a bit. So every time they buy a property, it does take it off the tax rolls. And I have gone to numerous governors and legislators trying to get a Robin Hood bill for Albany County to get payment in lieu of taxes, and it's politically untenable as far as other le legislators around the state, and they usually knock it down saying that the Albany County is benefited greatly by having the university and we shouldn't complain. So I don't know if it'll ever pass. It would be nice if it would, but I'm not gonna hold my breath on that one. Yeah, exactly that. It's, it, again, I agree with Tim on that. But um, I did have a conversation with Tom Buchanan about this subject and asked him if, if I could come have a discussion with him and, and he agreed um, whether or not his input will have anything to do with it or not. But the situation that we have right now is there's only so many taxpayers in LA County. And as the infrastructure of the university grows, there isn't any more money in the pockets of the taxpayers. How many people own real estate? How many people own business real estate in the county? It, it's it's become I think as the university has further plans to expand, it's become a critical issue. And um, I think it will take more than myself. I think it will, you know, it will take more than than Tim. It would take more than the county commissioners alone. It's going to have to be a, a, a joint effort amongst not just the. We're really going to have to pull together. It's going to have to be the whole community. It's going to have to be the business community. And we're going to have to address this issue because at this point it's become critical with all the. Um, expansion of the university and we do want them to expand and we want it to be uh, um, an amenable sort of relationship but the fact of the matter is the 15,000 so or so property owners in Albany County can no longer support the infrastructure for the entities that we do have here so it, it, it's gonna, if I was elected that would be one of my major uh, one of the things that I would do to start out would be one of my major tasks is to try to deal with this issue so that we can continue to have this 
this town be the great town that it is and be able to support the sewers and the roads and the garbage and, and all the things that we need to do because the, the dump is, you know, another issue. As I walk back, the federal government is taking away our federal money, though, unfortunately. How about any of the rest of you? Do you have a solution for the county commissioners who are strapped for funds here? Okay. All right. The next question is for the fire district, and we'll start with you, George, because I'm not sure you got a chance uh, earlier. And one of the questions is, in the light of the long fire season in Albany County this year, what lessons have you learned that you would apply in the future? I think one of the, the biggest lessons for us that's come out of this probably is that, uh, and it's something we've been working on for a while, but um, I think it's never going to be a perfect issue, is the, uh, the interaction between the, the Forest Service and the, uh, the local fire entities. Uh, but all in all, I think that uh, we've probably done as much as we can. We're all very aware of the situation. Um, you know, thankfully we're, we're coming sort of to the end of fire season, but there's still a lot of fuel up there. Um, it's not over yet. Um, we have done everything we can to increase the level of training and to be as prepared as possible. Um, when we have these large fires, they sort of go beyond the local level. Um, if you notice with Squirrel Creek, when the Type 1 team came in, they can bring resources that we just don't have. Um, air and, and, of course, obviously a lot of other units. But um, I think all in all, we're, we're doing pretty well. Anyone else? Yes, one of the ongoing problems we've always had, as uh, George indicated, is you know, setting up the communications with the various entities. Uh, Forest Service likes to have its frequencies that it likes to use, and sometimes they are not on our radios that are set up within the county um, to work with uh, the, the fire warden and the rest of the entities. And you, so you get a large fire like this, especially you get a large team come in, sometimes they'll bring in their own uh, resources and frequencies, and now all of a sudden communications can get very uh, challenging on that. Uh, but a lot of it, you know, we've been working with the, the Forest Service, setting up meetings, trying to coordinate. Uh, we've been purchasing additional radios that are more tied towards the Forest Service frequencies that we can use uh, if we get a big team in or we have to go out into the forest and help them uh, with their uh, fire. So it's a lot of just uh, working on communication issues and then training and having face-to-face -face meetings so that uh, when we do show up with a fire, we have some understanding of what each other's capabilities are and we're not suddenly uh, meeting strangers, we're meeting people that we have worked with before. Okay. Anyone else want to deal with? Uh, Tim has, uh, oh, here you go. I forgot. You and I are sharing. Okay. Yeah, fire. I was a county commissioner back for eight years in the 90s, and I saw one type one team the whole time I was in. This, in the month of June, I saw three teams that I had to deal with. And the problem that we also have to address is red card issues and radio issues. We've spent a fortune in this county and in this state on the, the high frequency, or the 900 megahertz radio systems. And when we can't communicate with the federal government, it's really a shame because we got the money from them and we need to get that coordinated. I think that's a major, major issue that needs to be addressed. Anyone else? Larry. Judy, I just had, I just had a comment to make in the vein of what does the conservation districts do. We do have a, a advertisement out now inquiring from people affected by the fire of uh, what they view as problems, uh, assistance they might uh, like uh, us to help with in terms of reseeding, weed control. Uh, I personally, on the fire up by Laramie Peak, have seen a number of livestock ponds that have been filled with sediment from erosion out of those burn areas, and it would be good if we could get those cleaned out uh, to catch, hopefully there will be snow melt next spring uh, to catch some water for the people and so on. And so the conservation district does try to help people uh, 
whether they're ranchers or a small property owner, we try to help them with some of the issues after they're impacted by the flash. Anyone else? Okay. Anyone else? We'll move on with another question that, again, is for the county commissioners. And I've kind of lost track. Are we ready to start with you again, Tim? Or is it Shelley's turn? Shelley. It's Shelley's turn. Okay. This question is, how do you feel the hospital, or do you feel that the hospital, Ivinson Memorial, should be billing the county for Title 25 patients <coughs> Uh, for items that they use that are not covered by state statute. Of course, I'm not aware of any items that are not covered by state statute. Um, there was controversy over items that were physician prescribed items. Uh, we were not in a position, because of the statute, to get into a public discussion over what doctor, first of all, we are not qualified, it's against the law for us to make medical decisions for patients, but the physicians make those, uh, those uh, decisions, and, and the statute is fairly broad. It even allows that the county must buy clothing for a patient if they do not have clothing to wear to court. So, there's not a lot that isn't included in the statute, so I'm not sure where that question emanates from. But um, to get into a discussion publicly about uh, a patient at a particular time that was admitted and had particular services provided to them is also a violation of the statute, and we wouldn't enter into that discussion because it violates the law. Um, with the Title 25, Carl and I became good friends. Uh, there are issues, there were issues, and it's a matter of their billing uh, software, and we were billed for a lot of things that were probably not appropriate for Title 25, and, it's, and we've had those discussions, and we think we have it pretty well worked out. We're getting into that direction, I think. But there's still a lot of issues that are out there that we were billed for, and I uh, can't even, it was a large percentage that in the last go around that were not funded from the county because we didn't think they were appropriate for Title 25 type of expenditures. So, what is that? Title 25 is involuntary commitment. So, a kid all of a sudden gets drinks too much and his girlfriend breaks up with him and he says he's going to kill himself. His roommates call the police and they take him to the hospital involuntary commitment is what that is, and we get quite a few of them. Not necessarily that case, but we do have a lot of involuntary commitments in Albany County. Thank you. Our next question is for everyone to answer, and that is, what's your position on the ballot proposition that would have a sales tax of one quarter percent increase for economic development within Laramie, this would, or I guess within Albany County. This would be, um, to, uh, the, according to the questionnaire, to encourage more businesses. And um, let's see, who haven't we started with in a while? Ruth, got a position on that? <laughs> You're going to be voting on it, and there is a pro-con flyer about it on the back table. Yeah, but I get to vote secret ballot, right? So I don't really have to say. Um, you know, I do think that economic development in Albany County is hugely important, and I recognize that we don't have the oil and gas revenues that the other, many of the counties um, throughout the state of Wyoming have, and so um, we're going to have to do a lot more of that ourselves, is what it boils down to. And I kind of like that approach. I don't necessarily always say, yeah, let's do another tax, let's do that tax, let's do this tax. But aside from maybe looking at it from a tax point of view, I don't mind having to be self-reliant and looking at what type of community we are, how do we want to bring businesses in here, what do we want the future of our community to look like, what do we like about living here, what makes all of us stay, because I know coming up, 
but in January, February, the wind's going to blow and it's going to be icy and we can't walk across the street some of the time. So there's some real reasons that we stay here and value this community and I think that that has to really come into our dialogue of what type of economic structures we want to do. And I do think it's a community, countywide dialogue and discussion. And I don't know if a quarter cent sales tax solves the problem. If it jump starts that conversation and gets us headed in those directions, more power to a quarter cent sales. Larry, do you have Well, uh, I also, I guess, am not a, uh, a huge advocate of additional taxes, but I, I do like the community. I've lived here now for more than 30 years, and I have voted for other kinds of tax increases that I thought would benefit schools, whatever. And uh, I guess we'll see what the majority of the community think, but I, I would like to support uh, the economic development of the county in the city as much as we can. Uh, we have some disadvantages to being you know, in business in Laramie. There are advantages with the university students coming and spending money and, uh, and so on, but uh, I, again, I think we do need to, uh, to look to what we can do for the community to keep it a good place to live that it's been. George? I am personally opposed to the tax increase I believe that economic development is a good thing, but I don't think it is the role of government to do economic development. Um, as we all know, government, unfortunately, is extremely inefficient. Um, I believe that the private sector, if left alone and uh, given a favorable regulatory environment, uh, a favorable environment for business, I think that uh, the private sector can take care of itself. I don't think that uh, I'm not a pretty, I'm just not a fan of government programs. Uh, I don't think they're efficient, and I don't think in the long run that they really work. Listen from the fire district standpoint, there's not a whole lot of <laughs> impact other than hopefully if it would. Uh, help increase the property values around and bring in more uh, business and tax dollars into the, uh, the fire district area, that that would be a good thing. More volunteers. Yeah, more volunteers would also be an excellent uh, thing. So uh, from that standpoint, it's hard just from the position I'm in to uh, say yay or day. I think it's probably, uh, I think it's a good idea. And I think I would, you know, support the concept of the quarter percent uh, sales tax just to hopefully see what we can bring in. Hopefully it will be more than just Laramie and more into the uh, rest of the whole county. Okay. Joe? Oh, Joe? I'm not a big fan of taxes either, but the concept that the LEDC is proposing is to bring in a large business that would be what you call a value-added business where they are selling something that's sold outside the county and bringing revenue back into the county. So new dollars, not just recirculating the dollars of the local residents, where a lot of our local businesses recirculate the income of the employees of the university and various other entities. And, and if it was used in this fashion, and we really were doing something here that could be sold outside that brought new dollars into the county, I think it would be tremendously valuable. I would like to make sure that it is done um, and the money is monitored in a way that it, it, it you know, complies with the Wyoming Constitution. Um, I think that that would be pretty important and it's, I believe it's for a four year term and so it can be stopped after that four years if we don't feel we're getting our good value for money. Um, and it could be substantial, worth substantially more to us than a, a quarter um, point uh, in tax. And um, I just want to say too, with the back to the hospital district thing, we have a contract with the county now, and what what the expenditures are are really in a moot point, and they are the the contract amount is substantially less than what the county actually generates in costs. So it's a it's a it's a good give and take, I think, as far as that. I may be a liberal Democrat, but I'm a 
fiscal conservative, and I don't like taxes either. This particular tax is going to be a quarter cent, and when we were bidding for the GE project, the, Torrington came up with, they had had this tax in place for a couple of years and they had put together a lot of money and they built their industrial park over there with this, with this particular tax. And I'm not in favor of new taxes, but this particular tax gives a, uh, a, a funding stream to the economic development group where they currently get their funding from the city of Laramie, and I think this may be a burden that would be lifted off the city for off their tax rolls, and they could use this money. And so uh, I think it is a good thing if we can get the Sears Park going and we can get the industrial growth going inside this, the county, and that will increase the property base and the property values, so the school district, the hospital, the special districts, the county, city, everybody benefits from it. So we'll, we'll see. But I would like to put in a plug for the L, or for the uh, ActiBus, because I am on that board, the Albany County Transportation Authority, and that's a half a mil. And that works out to be about $2 per $100,000 of assessed value. Thank you. Okay, I think that was everybody for that question. Okay. This is actually the last two questions I have, and I'm going to combine them together, so don't ask me to repeat it, because I'm going to invent it here on the spot. But it is essentially county subdivision, rural subdivisions are running rampant. What is the impact on your office, and what are you going to do about it in terms of meeting the challenge of providing the questioner doesn't say, but infrastructure and fire protection and erosion control, I can imagine. What are you going to do about that in the next one to two years? The questioner asks, but uh, your term will be four years, I believe, for all of you, right? So let's expand it. You have four years to solve this problem that you created. <laughs> uh, it is a problem that we all have to live with, and that and that's where the county zoning comes in and the land use plan that we have. And we want to concentrate the development and not do leapfrog where we have county subdivisions with large parcels scattered throughout the county. It's been an issue with back in 1991 when I ran for county commissioner when Pat was the chairman way back when. That was the reason that I ran. I could see the subdivisions sprouting up going out towards Centennial on the ridge line out there, and there was just uncontrolled, and we have those on 230, and we have them north, we have them south, we have them in every direction, and it's a real problem, and that's where your land use planning comes into place, and that's one way we can control it. It is a big deal, and it cost us a lot of money through the road and bridge, uh, fire, and the sheriff's office. I mean, just the services that the county has to provide. And I saw a study out of Natrona County and the cost per subdivision per, I can't remember what the numbers were, but it was a substantial amount of money that it affects the counties whenever you have these rural subdivisions like the wild horse out there and various other subdivisions that we have. So we all pay for it in diminished library services, fairground services or other issues that the county is to deal with. And land use planning, they call it leapfrog, but they also call it strip development. And that's kind of what's taken place out 9th Street. We've got uh, an attractive area and it's developed further and further out 9th Street. And it is a drain on resources. And we have been talking about the issue with uh, inflation and, and economic uh, um, downturns. Uh, I think that um, one way is to try to create a plan that makes more sense in terms of the the issues with infrastructure, and and I'm you know before I I don't want to give the impression that I, I am opposed to land use planning. I am not opposed to land use planning, but I think it has to be always narrowly tailored to suit the purposes and uh, the benefits of the people of the community. So you would try to uh, manage that kind of development so that it isn't so so far out that you're not you don't have to push fire stations further and further out with big gaps in that area and that's that's one way to manage it and, I, and you know i have you know
know, not had the opportunity to make the analysis on what the cost is for some of the subdivisions, like the Wild Horse subdivision. But um, as you are doing development in, in land use planning, there's also something that they call an exaction. That they, it's, it's a, like a small taking that you place on developers. And that's that if they are going to make money off that subdivision, then they have to give something back to the community. They have to help with some of the costs, of, particularly in a, in a small community like this. It's like, is there going to be another school required? Where is the location going to be? And it is, that's something that's highly constitutional as an exaction. I know as part of the you know, process when you, you look at uh, changing uh, the, the zoning or use of land, that uh, they do send the new plot maps out to the fire district and to the county by a warden to look at and you know they do put a big uh, strain on when you're looking at only volunteer departments out there in the county with the support of you know, one truck coming from Laramie uh, that does put uh, a big strain plus the whole idea of water you know, when you look out into the county the number of water sources that we have that we can draw on to fight fire are very limited and so we sort of look at some of the big developments and try to determine, okay, do we need to have a, put in a cistern into that development so that uh, if we do have a number of uh, houses or something that uh, we may not have to either run our tankers into Laramie to fill up at the hydrant or run out to uh, Centennial to do that. But there is you know, some sort of water source close by that is somewhat replenishable that we can use because that's the big uh, thing and then just you know, getting the number of volunteers uh, out there and hopefully as we get some subdivisions we can hopefully talk some people into wanting to become volunteers and then we can work with the developer and maybe put a small substation up in a, a remote area that so we can put a truck or two in and that will certainly help but it is something that we constantly look at sure. For the fire district, these subdivisions are sort of a double-edged sword. Uh, on the one hand, um, that puts more people into the area, provides more volunteers, hopefully, um, and also the, uh, the assessed value of the property goes up when you're putting a house on it and all of a sudden it's zoned residential instead of agricultural. Uh, on the other hand, obviously we have more structures to protect. Um, especially, and that's from structure fires and from wildland. We, we increase the um, wildland urban interface. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things we can do to try to help mitigate the problem, as, as Kirk alluded to, one of our big challenges out there is water sources. Um, currently within the, the subdivision regulations, they um, are required to do certain things to help provide water sources. Unfortunately, one of the, the major ones that's used is a cistern. Uh, gets checked, gets filled when it gets put in, and nobody looks at it again, and 10 years later, it's dry. So there's a few things like that that I think that we can probably uh, try to step up and do a little bit better on to help with the problem. But uh, really, for us, it's, it's sort of a catch-22. It's got its good points, and it has its bad. Well, I'll put on my conservation district hat for sure because I don't really, I'm uncomfortable, personally uncomfortable with the conversion of ag lands into other uses. I think agriculture is our primary production base that holds a steady line when oil and gas prices move up and down. It is the one commodity that is still produced in the United States that we have some sort of control over in terms of the landowners themselves can make, still make decisions and determine what kind of product they want in the market. Every time we do convert um, ag land to other uses, we have a loss of wildlife habitat, we have impacts to watershed, we have loss of fisheries. And so I too have enjoyed the benefits of living outside of town but I think that it becomes hugely important 
to have the discussions so that there's backfill into some of these areas so they don't get spread out and dropped so far. And we talk about what is a livable community and how do you make it so attractive that people enjoy living in town more than they do plowing a small road to get out to the highway in the winter times here and some of the difficulties of just living out in the country. Certainly some of the people that are moving out to some of these subdivisions don't understand what they're getting into and how harsh the environment is. And you see that with some of the questions they ask the conservation district about things to plant in one thing or another. Uh, we, again, in the role of not telling anyone they can't do anything, uh, which is basically the conservation district's uh, position, uh, we will provide technical advice to the best of our ability to anyone who asks. We will not spend tax dollars in cost sharing a project that we have reason to believe will fail. And so as far as uh, putting up wind breaks, we have approved and are putting in a couple of wind breaks uh, in the Wild Horse subdivision, for example, far enough west that they can get into the Mesa Verde sandstone and have water that's usable uh, to keep them water. But we're very hesitant to think about you know, that someone's going to be watering uh, windbreak when wood water they haul from town in the back of their truck. Uh, a lot of these people don't realize what that's like in the middle of the winter or how much water a household uses. Uh, so that's sort of our stance. We'll help as best we can with these projects, uh, but we certainly uh, don't put money into projects that we don't think have a chance of being successful and actually providing benefit. Okay, I'm going to do something a little extraordinary. We haven't done it at any of our other forums, but I want to ask the panelists if they have any questions they'd like to ask each other. Anything that hasn't been addressed? George has his hand up. Actually, I do, I do have a quick, quick question for the Conservation District. Um, you talked about some of the reclamation issues after the fires. Does the conservation district do anything to help with uh, fuel mitigation, defensible space, things like that? We, we certainly uh, have uh, provided uh, technical advice on that. Uh, there's the uh, backyards and barnyards project. It's, uh, uh, collaborative effort uh, with the university, uh, with extension, and with the county, and with the uh, with the conservation district, and so on. And we we help with planning uh, on those, uh, those efforts. Uh, try to again let people understand what uh, what they're looking at. Uh, these coniferous forests, uh, you know, it's one disaster or another. It's either insects or fire or something uh, is going to come through, and it's uh, it's something that needs to be planned for. Anyone else with a question? I have one for Kirk and George, perhaps, and that is how well protected are we if there was a hazardous spill and fire on Interstate 80 coming into Laramie from the uh, east down the, the aquifer, I gather. Um, I understand the Vitaboo Fire Department is sort of non-functional at the moment. What can you tell us? As part, you know, we're doing a lot on the training, and as we get into becoming what we call a firefighter one, which is a you know, structured firefighter, part of that is we do get into the hazmat operations aspect of it, which is mostly we're going to be out there. We have to don an SCBA to try and build a dike or a dam to try and prevent things from going. But that's pretty much the end of what the uh, volunteers would do. If we really get into a hazardous materials leak, then the Laramie Fire Department is the local regional uh, hazmat team. And so, you know, if we're getting there and we see, recognize that oops, we got something really nasty by the placard that's on the truck, um, that's what the first thing we're going to do is call in the uh, Laramie Fire Department. And they're going to be, they have the experts that are then going to be able to do what needs to be done. And if they don't, then they will call into the further uh, 
expertise that uh, maybe in Cheyenne or down in Colorado if we get a really big uh, thing. But there's sort of a limit as to what uh, we as the volunteers are going to be able to, uh, to do on that. George has a response, and then Tim. I think Kirk really kind of hit it the nail on the head there. Um, because of uh, funding and because of the amount of training that's required to deal with a, um, uh, certain types of, of spills, it's really outside of the scope of what the volunteer departments can do. Um, you know, our folks, thankfully, we've got a lot of people that are willing to go through a lot of training, but they're not willing to go through quite that much and unfortunately we don't have the funding to have the resources to handle incidents like that. Um, really the way things are set up is through um, the Department of Homeland Security and through FEMA. They have these regional response teams as Kirk alluded to. Um, we have one that's based here with the City of Laramie Fire Department. Um, that is sort of one of the things that they really do. And as far as Vitabu, I don't think the, the current situation there, and I, I guess before I go too far, I should say that we are in the process of rebuilding that department. We have had a, a public meeting that had a surprisingly good turnout, and we are working on getting that back on its feet. But um, really, I, I think the, it really doesn't change the situation as far as hazmat spills go. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, you as taxpayers voted for the special purpose tax last time and we are in the process of doing the, the I-80 Telephone Canyon remediation for such a toxic chemical spill, which is very unfortunate and that really affects the aquifer. But the, I have a question for the fire district. Fire district number one encompasses Rock River South, not including the town of Rock River and not including Centennial, or Centennial, Laramie. As I know when I was on the fire district, I was trying to push for setting up separate fire districts so Centennial would have its own fire district because of the issues that you've had with Vitaboo and the chief up there, at least they would have their own home rule instead of having a centralized fire district. Have you given that any thought to set up a separate fire districts, our district one, two, three, and four, and maybe even combine a couple into one. I know during various, you know, controversies that have cropped up, uh, some of the departments have looked at that, and I think sometimes by breaking the, basically the bill tax down into the much smaller pockets, it doesn't make it uh, fiscally responsible you know, it would make it be very hard for some of these districts to be able to have the funds to even operate. Um, especially if we we look at uh, you know about a quarter of our uh, expenditures go to the contract with Laramie, so that they can bring that truck out uh, and support the volunteers in fighting a fire. Can I just? break in on that point. So I'm thinking that fire district number one would be the zone around Laramie basically and that would take care of that contract with the city. Well, if, if the fire district number one was just the donut around there, I think that's where most of the tax money is and so it would have you know, significant funding. But the, say, Little Laramie, departments, if that was a district, I'm not sure they have the funding to be able to support. And we have to then look at, uh, you know, between district, uh, you know, uh, agreements so that if the donut paid for the Laramie contract, would they then, you know, want to go out into a different district to support the fire or not? And so I think a lot of times, I think we have a economy of scale by being able to keep the entire district and then having the five volunteer fire departments that were able to distribute the money a little better to where it is needed at any particular moment. Shelly? Or let's give George a chance. So this is something I've thought long and hard about. Um, 
from an administrative standpoint, I think it would be a little easier. There'd probably be a few less headaches. Uh, but I think all in all, when you look at the whole, I think Kirk's absolutely right from a physical standpoint and from a resource standpoint. I think we're a lot better if we can pool our resources. Uh, to give you one example, if, we're, if we break it up into multiple districts, each individual department doesn't always have the resources to respond to a fire in their district. Even, even our largest department, Centennial, um, a lot of times we get what calls where other departments come and help out. And if we've got them all broken up, they don't necessarily train together, they don't necessarily work well together. In the last couple of years, we've instituted a training group, and I have seen a marked improvement in the way the folks from these various departments they're all working together as a team, and I'm a, I would really hate to mess that up. Um, and to, to answer Tim's question about the contract with the city, um, I think that the, the contract with the city benefits everyone in the area, um, not just the folks around the donut, because it provides these, the contract with the city means that they ban a pumper that is jointly owned with the city and the district, they also provide officers, they provide incident commanders, they provide a lot of trained resources. So I think it benefits everyone. I'd like to go back to the original question because I didn't get to answer that about I-80. And um, the, there is, uh, at least uh, Dave Gerge said that the part of the special purposes they're uh, putting out for a study on whether or not they can create some catchment areas along I-80. And uh, you know, I think that, that we not only need to have catchment areas, but I would like to see us know with some kind of uh, certainty and frequency what's coming down the highway. A lot of the things that come down the highway are federally regulated, including radioactive material. And I think in order to understand what the magnitude of our exposure is, we really need to understand what's coming down the highway. And uh, if it is a spill, uh, that involves certain types of chemicals and or radioactive material, you know, is, uh, is a catchment area going to suffice? Um, and I think that the, ca the county needs to keep the citizens informed on the progress in this area. And that, uh, that hasn't been happening. We talk about it over and over, and who is doing what, and, and when is something going to happen that protects us from the potential catastrophe it could have. And it's not just the aquifer, it could be materials that um, expose people in the town to gases that uh, can be fairly noxious. And, and we do have hazmat training at the hospital, we have emergency preparedness in the county, but I still think we need to have a better understanding as a community what's coming down that highway. And, and, and if at all possible, track what's coming down the highway and how much of how airborne frequency. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's give a hand to all these panelists. And now, panelists, give a hand to the audience. How about that? Thank you for the stage. I'd like to remind you before we close that the League of Women Voters has a flyer on the back table by the door which is pro-con statements about the three constitutional amendments that will be on your ballot. Remember, if you fail to vote on an amendment, what does it count as? A no vote. So it pays to be attentive to what the issues are. Also in a little basket on the back table are some copies of a pocket response guide that tells you what to do in your own home if there is a threat of tornado, fire, flood, whatever, who to call, what to do, and um, it's sort of just a quick and dirty thing that you can keep in your wallet if you want to. That's why it's folded up so tiny. And um, I'm sure Nathan would say, on behalf of the library, we're glad you're here, and we hope you'll stick around a minute to help put the chairs away and to buttonhole these candidates who really want to talk to you. And that includes our two candidates for other offices who are here, Matt Green, Matt Blaylock. Anybody else come in running for office that I didn't notice? OK. I think we are ready for the interaction that you'll have one-on-one. -on -one.